If you were to tell me the top ten temptations that people deal with and people have to handle, realizing that we've already learned from the book of James that really temptation is viewed in two ways in the book of James. Number one, so, uh, or in the chapter uh, of of uh, the first chapter of James, it's viewed two ways. Number one, just the regular solicitation to evil, you know, temptation to evil. But then it's also temptation is viewed as uh, uh, how are you going to respond when you are under pressure? How are you going to respond when you're under trial? You know, that kind of temptation. It's kind of viewed in both of those way, ways. So if I were to throw it, understanding both of that definition of temptation, um, if I were to say, what are the, just throw out top ten what you think, things that people struggle with in temptation, what would they be? All things decently in order, raise your hand. Yes, sir. Envy. Envy. What else? Anxiety. Anxiety. Anger. Yes. Pride. Pride. Yes. Bitterness. Bitterness. And by the way, we know that none of us are talking about ourselves. We're all talking about other people. These are things that other people struggle with, all right? Something else, okay? That's about five, six maybe. What else? There's some real obvious ones, yes. Okay, selfishness. What else? Desires. Desires. Guys, what? Men struggle a lot with what? Lust, all right? Uh, things that we see, whatever, okay? What else? Yes. Greed. There's a good one we missed. So let's just say we're at, we're at eight. Two more. What do people struggle with? Temptation. Okay, self-control, temperance. All right, yes. What, it, anything else? Yes. Uh, was that? Idolatry. Idolatry. Oh, yeah, making idols of things. Good. Yeah. Some, some, someone else. I see someone, like, moving their lips. You got to, like, really, you know, come on. Yes. Gossip. Very good. Gossip. All right, we'll give one more. Yes. Jealousy, okay. So we, we are, uh, you know, some of these have, have overlapped. So basically we've got in view, you know, temptations that, you know, a lot of us struggle with. James chapter 1, if you'll notice, we're going to pick back up on a brand new thought in verse number 13. Verse number 13. So the first half of James is prim primarily about, we already said the word, what is it? It's about temptation, right. Okay, so here we go. Why don't you stand up? Stand up. We'll, we'll, we'll get these few verses read. Verse number 13, it's still in the same thing, but it gives kind of new thinking. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, or God's tempting me. For God cannot be tempted with evil or by evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust, uh, by the way, verse number, beginning of verse number 14, you see a process of temptation, a process of temptation. So you see what happens as it's not just like you're tempted and do wrong. Okay, there's a process here. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Help us, Lord, open our hearts as we give the word now. Thank you for your precious word. I pray we would cover this very thoroughly. I pray that you would be exalted, your son Jesus Christ would be exalted, and that the Holy Spirit would point to him. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we pick up on a new thought about temptation. You see it in verse number 13. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Who in the world would ever say that? You know, first when you read that, you say, you know, that's silly. No one would ever say that God was tempting him to do something wrong. You know, that's just kind of a silly thought. But you have to understand the context. You have to remember back two clicks last week and the week before. You have to think about the context here that this statement is in the context that we should be joyful during temptation because it's actually good for us. And that the trying of our faith builds what? What's the word? It builds patience or endurance. So endurance so that 
our endurance is that so that we are getting stronger against that temptation, stronger giving glory to God as time goes on. We are resisting temptation. We are obeying God. We're glorifying God. And we're also coming to a certain place, and that is that we would be perfect and entire wanting nothing. That is that all the crutches would be gone from our lives, the crutches of anxiety, as someone said, the crutches of needing so much money when, when trials come because, so that you won't have to depend on God. All the crutches will be gone, and, and that brings us to a place of completeness and maturity as believers. So he's saying, be happy during diverse or when you fall into a bunch of temptations because it's good for you, because it brings forth good things. So in that context, you can see why someone would jump to the conclusion Amen. Thank you, God, for bringing these temptations. Does God, however, bring you to the enticement point of doing wrong? Yes or no? No. And that's what it's clarifying here. It says in verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted that God did it, that I am tempted of God. So if falling into diverse temptations yields ultimately good for the Christian it's, is it right or wrong to say that God is the author of the temptations? It is wrong. It is wrong. God does not tempt you. All right? Let's be very clear. He never does it. He allows trials, but never uh, is luring you to sin against him, to become discouraged, to doubt. He is not bringing you to that point, okay? He is not bringing you to that point to encourage that. And I think we're safe to say this, okay? And, and reasoning it out, this is how it works. I think we're safe to say that even when God tests us, okay, and puts us to a, the, that place, the only outcome that he is bringing us to is the successful outcome of obedience to him. When you see this temptation, look at the beginning of the passage. When you see these, this trying of our faith that is working patience, all right, we know that there's two ways in the road that we can go, give in to the temptation or resist it. God is always in this, he's saying what is good for you is when you learn to resist it more and more and more and more. He is never saying that it is good to fail. He's never saying that it is, he wants you to do evil. He is never tempting you to evil. I think we need to clarify that, that though the product of striving against temptation in our life is ultimately good, God is never the one who is trying to put the decision in front of you to do wrong. Are we clear on that? Say amen if we're clear. Amen. Just grab the truth. God never, never entices or tempts you to do evil. Never can be blamed on God. There is a character trait of God that keeps that from happening. It's farther in the verse. Keep reading. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Why can't we ever say that? For God cannot be what? Tempted with, wake up, here we go. God cannot be tempted with evil. Here is a character trait. If you wanted to come to this church tonight and find something to be reminded of about God or really to think about, here it is. God, it is an impossibility for God ever to consider doing wrong. It is an impossibility for God to ever be titulated with the desire to choose to be unfair or to be to be, to be sinfully mean or to, to be something that is sinful. He cannot be tempted by evil. It is never a possibility for him. And that is why he never tempts any man. So how, how we can know that God would never put us into a situation where it seems like he's pushing us to do wrong is because he himself never can become tempted. Now I want you to look at, stare at a little bit. God, for verse number 13b, for God cannot be tempted with evil. God uses, if you see those three words, stare at the verse, cannot be tempted. If you see that in your Bible, God used, as he breathed it out by inspiration, only one word for those three words, and it, and it is the word untemptable. Okay, when you say someone is invincible, okay, God chose one word for that, non-temptable or untemptable. So when you think of God, you can just think of that one word. He is untemptable. It's translated in English, cannot be tempted. Okay? He is untemptable. It is impossibility for God to ever slip. God's not going to 
accidentally be a bad God one day. And what does it, tell me what, do, what does that tell you about his character? Okay, what can we say? What can we praise because of that? He, he is holy, what else? He is unchangeable, what else? Perfect, immutable, all right? Especially the characteristics that are non-slippable. Char the characteristics that he never is like us. He never will slip from his holy position. Okay, he is untemptable. God is untemptable with evil. Or I think that you see that word with doesn't, is not, you know, there as it was spoken by inspiration either. It was a word to help us understand. So it's really, the phrase is God, untemptable, evil. He is, evil does not have any temptability on God. He is just so far removed from it because of his holiness. He's not like, I might do that. Never, never, ever. I want you to think about that for a moment and just you really realize you have no waffle in God. There's no waffle in God. He, it's impossible for him to do something wrong. He's not enticed to do it. This separation from sin, this really the right word is holiness, this holiness in him is why he promises you that he'll never bring you to that point. Okay, he will never he will never be pulling you. That is not God. If you are drawn to do something wrong, that is never God leading the way. That's a great way to think about it, isn't it? God is totally removed from sin. This verse always brings up a big question. Does anybody know what the question is? And maybe it's just mulling over in your mind. Does anybody know what controversial question this verse always brings up? I'll read it again. God, some of you are smiling. Maybe you know it or maybe you're just happy tonight. All right. So let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. This phrase brings up a question. For God cannot be tempt tempted with evil. What question does it bring up? Anybody know? It's a little controversial argument. Okay, we got the right name. Jesus. Right. Okay, so the question that it brings up is, Yes. Okay, and the, and the ultimate next step of that question is, could Jesus have sin? Could Jesus have sin? Half of you shake your head yes, half of you shake your head no. That's why it's a controversial question. I think it's important to talk, to talk about because we know the divinity of Jesus Christ. We know that he was God. This verse does also apply to God. Yet... What Melinda brought up, the verse that he brought up, we are told in several places that he was tempted. So how does that work together? These two thoughts work together. Could Jesus have sinned then, considering verse 13 says God can't be tempted with evil? I want to answer that. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, verse 15, the second part, it says that he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's not the only place this temptation is mentioned. In Hebrews 2.18 is, is maybe even a clearer, um, a clearer verse showing the fire of the temptation, the pull of the temptation, when Hebrews 2.18 says that Christ suffered being tempted. All right? Do you understand that when you fight, are fighting against temptation, that I said this a couple weeks ago, that it is suffering like Jesus suffered, Okay. The Bible uses that struggle uh, against resisting temptation in our lives. He, it uses the word suffering for that. I mean, you are suffering in the body because your flesh wants to give in to do wrong. Whether it be gossip, whether it be envy, whether it be jealousy, it is suffering in the flesh. So here we have Jesus Christ in Hebrews 2.18, suffering. The verse goes out of its way to let you know that Jesus knows and feels the fire of your temptation. The first verse that I talked about, Hebrews 4.15 says, for we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was an always tempted, uh, like as we are, yet without sin. Okay? So it wants, you, it's wants, to, you to, it wants to go out of its way to show you that Jesus knows what it's like to resist temptation, to suffer, to struggle against temptation. I mean, let's be honest, 40 days and 40 nights whooped him. It wasn't just physical food that caused the, minister, the, the angels to come to minister to him at the end of the 40 days. Struggling against sin takes a lot out of you. Especially when you're fighting with, with the devil himself offering the Son of God to 
the highest things that could ever tempt him. Jesus' humanity felt the same desire that we do to sin. I'm going to clarify that in a moment. That temptation was a fight to him, a legitimate struggle. It would have been different from ours only in one way. He did not have a sin nature. It would have been like Adam and Eve's struggle about the fruit. They didn't have a sin nature either. All right? It doesn't take a sin nature to be lured into doing wrong. And that's what we learn from that. Okay? That Christ's struggle would have been similar to Adam and Eve's that were Eve was so tempted and the devil talking her to her into that, that taking that, that, uh, that fruit. Same struggle Christ endured. Desire for the same things put before him. So I believe in his humanity that Christ struggled against this, this desire to sin just like we do. But what was different about Jesus Christ is that he was not single-natured. He was not just a man. He was the divine. He was God. And that's what jumps us into this verse. That character trait about him, that his nature, that he was God and man, understands me to believe this verse straight out, that he, he, though tempted to sin, though fiery tempted to sin, though struggling against sin, though worn out against the struggle against sin, though suffering against sin, he could never have sinned. Him being divine, it is of my belief in this verse that Jesus could never have chosen to do wrong. And let me tell you what, I want you to think about the ramifications of what would have happened if he, if he would. It's not just one of the big ones to us is what? He could not have done what? He could not have been our Savior. He would not have been the perfect sacrifice. But it's more than that. If God would have, if God would have denied his own character, I mean, I, I believe the universe would have split open. The Bible says that by Jesus all things consist and all things are sustained. God denying his character would have had cataclysmic results. I don't know what they were, would have been. I don't even want to imagine if God ever had the possibility to turn evil or to do wrong. It would be, it would be results that would be cataclysmic that we couldn't even imagine. And that's why it's so wonderful, people, that it says in verse number 13 that God cannot be tempted with evil. There is no chance of that happening and why I would say and I would argue that Jesus Christ, though struggling hard against temptation, there was no chance that he would have given into it. And I would just say, aren't you glad for verse number 13 about a God who, the God who holds your salvation and deals with you, uh, deals with you as a perfect good father from a, from a perfectly good father's position? He can never be tempted to do sin. Isn't it, isn't it reassuring that your God is not going to slip? Isn't it reassuring that, that his promises are in place because he is immutable? He does not change. And those promises, not one of them will ever fail because he's not like my dad or your daddy. He is like the perfect father who never, ever goes back on any of his promises. He never deals wrongly ever. And we've already talked about the joy that Christ would have or could have, could not have, or would not have sin. And so we do, did have a perfect substitution. Well, verse number 14 through 15 goes on with this whole thing about being tempted. So we know that God's not going to do it, and he's not going to do it because of his character. But so how, how in the world do we get into temptation and fall to temptation? Look at verse 14. But every, why don't you read it out loud with me, please? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. I will read 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. So we've got to slow down. I want you to play Sunday school with me tonight. Here's a process. According to my count, it has at least four steps in the process. All right? I think they are valid. I don't think that God is just talking here. I think he wants to explain to us what happens when temptation comes, when we're, when we're, when we, if I start saying this, I'm going to give away the process. Forget it. What's the process? Give me four points. What's number one? Four-point four process to temptation. It begins in verse number 14. Yes, sir. Drawn away is number one. He is drawn away, okay? The idea of getting off track, the idea of being led somewhere, okay? He is 
drawn away as number one. And I'm going to add to that this, the next word. We're going to count that in, in point number one. What is the next word? He's drawn away and enticed. Okay, that could be two. I guess you could make five. Enticed. I learned something about this word because I used to always use the word enticed the same as I, I used lust and like desire, but it's a different word. Enticed here means entrapped. It is a step beyond drawn. I mean, he's drawn away, and then there comes this point when he's, he's being pulled to do something wrong where he actually sticks his foot. He is us, isn't it? We actually stick our foot in the trap. Okay, there is a entrapment. Enticed here is, is a word that means entrapped. All right, so what would be the next point then? We got drawn away of his own lust, and let's make entice number two. And what's number three then? Yeah, I heard it. What? Okay, lust hath what? Conceived. What does that, what do you think of when you think about the word conceived? Yes, brought forth. It's a baby term. It is, it is here too. It is, it is, uh, it's actually the step beyond the entrapment that you're acting on into the sin. I mean, there's something happening. There's, we believe that babies are, are uh, life at conception. Okay, here is what this conception of sin. Here is when you're doing something. When you're putting your hand forward and you grab a hold of something to steal it. It's that moment that it's talking about. It is acting on the desire, con the conception of the sin. And then that bring, that's the next step is what? Then it does what? So number four is brings forth sin. It births it. Brings forth is the term birth. God uses the word birth. Okay, that's what is happening. It's birthing sin. Okay, and then number five would be what? And sin brings forth death. Okay, now listen. This isn't only talking to unsaved people. In fact, contextually, it is saved people. And we, we don't like to think about sin being death because we don't want, we know that that has to do with unsaved people, at least so we think. Okay, but listen, when you go through this process to a, an unsaved man, if you just count his whole life this way, it's going to lead to the death of eternal separation from God in hell. We all understand that's eternal death, separated from God. But what dies when a Christian follows this process? Well, I heard something. What? Fellowship with God is broken. What else is, what else is killed? Is done? Your testimony? What else? Joy, right? What else is dying? I, I can't hear what that is. Someone said the same thing. What is it? Um, well, your body is dying as a result of the original fall, yes, but I'm talking about just as when we do it wrong, when you follow this process, sinning, what is in jeopardy of dying? All these things are true. Your fellowship with God, when you, when you follow this road of sin, you know, your testimony, your joy, all these things are right on. What else is dying? How about your reputation? Testimony, reputation, I guess that's the same thing. What else? Pre yeah, okay. Okay, I can go with that. Even a, a Christian is promised premature death if they are, if they are uh, non-repentant. Yet, yeah, if they are chastened, even to the point of death. Is that kind of the thinking? Yeah. Okay. What else? Anything else? What else is dying? I just wrote down the same things. Relationship. Okay, here's, I don't think you said this one. Boy, you, you really can kill your relationship with other people, can't you, when you follow the process of sin. You know, you can hurt your relationship with your spouse. You can hurt your relationship with friends, the person that you've done something to, you've gossiped against, you've stolen from. All right? This is the end of that process. So, so basically, our, our desires, our lusts, draw us away. That lust. Uh, it, it, we are in, enticed, we put our foot in, in a trap, it's like almost a place of no return, lust hath conceived, it, it brings forth like a baby, sin, full-blown sin, sin uh, brings forth death, this can happen over a process or it can happen very momentarily, it also describes the momentary process of just a few moments of falling into sin. I want you to notice a phrase in here that I think is pretty interesting. 
Notice what it says here, and sin, middle verse, number 15, the end, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Why is it put in there, when it is finished? In the process of sin, right before brings forth death, brings forth the death, you know, in a Christian's life of, of these things, why does it say, when it is finished? Okay, we're on the right track. Let me give you a hint. Okay, let me, let me slow you down here. I'm going to give you a little, a little kind of a thought on this. Did Adam and Eve die the second they, ate, they took a bite of the fruit? Right. They began dying, right? But when was it finished? When their body physically died? And that wasn't for years and years and years. I think the point here is that, you know, some people get involved in sin and nothing, ha no hammer of God comes do down right away, does it? I mean, we have to realize that many times the, the death or the consequences of our sin potentially take weeks, months, years to play out. And we never must have, the fear of God tells us that you can't, well, nothing happened to me, I guess I'll just keep on doing it, right? And it, sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. You know, it's kind of the idea, be sure your sins will find you out. There is a time element. It's, a, it's right what Melinda was saying, that there's a time element here of, of what is going to happen, what's going to happen. So you see here a process here. In this, if I were to ask you, in this process, scan over 13 through 15, in this sin process or temptation process, where is the place to get the victory? Someone tell me, where is the place to get the victory in that list, in that process? What's that? I think there's a good argument for that. Or at least, at least while you're being drawn. When you get to the entice, there's the idea of trap. I mean, you're already snared here. Do you, can you think of any other verse that would substantiate that idea that right at the beginning of being drawn is the place to get the victory? You got it? Quote it. Good spiritual wickedness in high places. That's not the one that I was thinking of. Okay. Okay. I was thinking more of a time element. So wh is there another verse you're thinking of about like right at the beginning of, of temptation? I agree with Sandy hugely that you fight the fight by watching, and there's a whole lot of this other stuff. Next week, after we move out there, I'm going to show you some strategies against temptation that is the result of this, but you, can you think of other, any other verse that talks about right at the beginning? Yes, sir. Yes, that's not the one, unfortunately, I was thinking about. I will, next time you hear me preach this, it'll be, I'll do that. Yes. Okay, that's great, too. There it is. That's the one I was thinking of too. Okay, here it is. It is 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it has that element of right when you're being drawn of making this decision to get out of there before you put your foot in the trap. It's, there hath no temptation taken in you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So it has that element that right at the beginning when you're being drawn, is, there is a way of escape, but if you continue on, your foot's going to be in the trap and there's no turning back. And I think all of us have experienced with our mouth or with our thoughts or whatever, you hit that point uh, and you, you know that you're doing wrong and you just keep on going. Is that only me or do you, do you understand what I'm talking about too? Okay. And it's not long before the Holy Spirit says, what in the world are you doing? The victory is escaping right at the beginning of being drawn and once you follow your desires, you are enticed, you are entrapped, as it says in verse number 14. And these, these, these verses would seem to teach us something that uh, ran humble from the wilds. Uh, you know, we sent our kids to the wilds camp, but he, you know, I think it was him or Tom Farrell down there that would teach the young people that there's this crossroads in every temptation, that you, this point that you come to right at the beginning where you are going to either flee 
and look for the escape or you're going to continue a little bit farther, but that little bit farther is committing you to the entrapment. Okay? So the verses would seem to indicate the initial, initial moment of being drawn, God makes a way of escape by his divine help, saying uh, that mean thing, he, he makes a way of escape of, of thinking it or lying or impurity or whatever you want to apply that to. And that, I think, is why Sandy's point is valid, why we're to be watching right at the beginning of these things and to recognize when we're being drawn away. If you were to look at these verses tonight as we land the plane and you were to, you were to pick a one word out of verse 14 and 15, so you have to look at them. If you were to pick one word in these verses to rightly assign the blame for your failure in temptation, what would that one word be in verse 14 or verse 15 go? I'm asking if you were to pick one word in verse 14 or 15 to rightly assign the blame to for, your, for falling into temptation, what would that word be? Own. Own. Look, at, look how clearly it is, verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of the devil, when he is drawn away of a bad influence at school, when he is drawn away of his, his or her environment that they came from, when they're drawn away because of habits that their mother instilled in them. No, the word is clearly his own lust and enticed. Now here, we're going to just hit hard on this really quickly. I know some, many of you are tired tonight, and that's fine. Stop playing victim mentality concerning your temptation. Stop blaming your sinful habits on someone who taught them to you or someone who's pulling you away into them. Or stop blaming it, frankly, on the devil. You know, you are responsible in these verses. I am responsible what draws me away to do wrong? My own lust. My own, own, own lust. I am the one who is responsible for my wrongdoing. When something happens, so, we're so quick to look for some reason that we failed, some reason we did wrong. Look no farther than your mirror. You're drawn away of your own lust. Assign responsibility to yourself not to the world, not to the environment, not to the liberal media, not to everything around you, not to someone who led you into temptation, not to your past history, not to your past baggage. It is your own fault when you do wrong. We must never play the victim on this. We are not children that point the finger. You remember, you know, some of you teach, you know, you know, Johnny did it, Johnny made me do it. You know, Johnny, someone else, okay? No, it's not Johnny's fault. If you're an alcoholic, I'm using extreme examples. If you're an alcoholic or use drugs or have an immoral lifestyle or a myriad of other small, what we would consider smaller sins, it is your fault. It's not hereditary. Okay? You may be tempted more because of hereditary reasons. But who, what, whose fault is it when you follow through on what you're drawn to do? It is your own fault, your own lust. It's a great word there not people who did whatever to you. Take responsibility. Seek to change your mind by biblical thinking on that sin issue. Get serious about that sin issue and what the Bible says about it and how you need to renew your mind to think like the Bible. Make reconciliation or restitution where you need to, but own up to the temptation and the sin. This is the only way you will overcome it and resist it. It is my fault, O oh Lord. I need Christ's help. I need your help. I need a renewed mind. To, to stop sin's draw and to obey you. On Sunday night, I, tr I really tried to preach about how Christ was everything, even in our Christian growth. Now, I'm going to give you the Christ, the point of Christ in this whole temptation thing. And we're going to be done. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18, we quoted part of it, but it says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved Jesus, him, to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now listen to this. For in that he, Jesus himself, hath suffered being tempted, he is able to aid or relieve them that are tempted. And that is the word succor. We don't use that, but to aid or to relieve them. 
a very legitimate strength for temptation is crying out to Christ who has suffered in all points like you. Okay? The appeal directly to Christ for aid and relief in those sin issues. The thought, the thought simply ends, look at verse 16, do not err, my beloved brethren. The word err is a word play. Remember, the first step was to be drawn away of your temptation. It's like to get off the road. That's what the word error means also. A different word, but it means to get off track. Do not get off track. Don't, you know, right at the beginning of the temptation, get back on track. Don't be drawn away. Don't be led away to what your own lust wants to do. And it just says, it's a command. It's a loving command, but it just says, don't do it. Don't err, my beloved brother.